Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Advances in Robotic Heart Valve Surgery. If I have yet to meet you, I'm the patient who started heartvalvesurgery.com all the way back in 2006. The mission of our website is simple. We want to educate and empower patients just like you. And this webinar, which has had over 500 registrations from patients in countries all over the world, was designed to support that very important mission. Now, throughout the webinar, you're going to be in what's known as listen-only mode, but I encourage you to submit your questions in the control panel on your screen. And as we look at the agenda, I'll explain why. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce the featured speakers. We're going to look at the unique applications of robotic technology and techniques for heart surgery, then spend some time evaluating advantages and patient outcomes for this technique. We're going to then answer your questions, which you have submitted in your control panel, and we're going to conclude, I'm going to ask you to complete a very quick five-question survey. Now, when it comes to the featured speakers of today, I am honored and I am humbled that they are taking time away from their very busy practices at Penn Medicine Heart and Vascular Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So who are they? Well, Dr. Palvin Atlery is the director of minimally invasive and robotic cardiac surgery. He's also the director of cardiac transplantation and he is a professor of surgery. During his incredible career, which expands over two decades, he's performed over 2,000 heart valve procedures. Dr. Atlery, you and I have known each other for a long time. It is great to see you, and thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Adam, and I look forward to talking really to this wonderful audience that, is, uh, that has made time on if you're on the East Coast on this Thursday evening, if you're on the West Coast, this late Thursday afternoon. So thank you again. Yeah. And so the other half of the dynamic duo today is Dr. Michael Ibrahim. He is the director of reconstructive valve surgery. He's the surgical director of mechanical circulatory support. He's an assistant professor of surgery, and he's performed over a thousand heart valve procedures. Dr. Ibrahim, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Adam. It's great to be with you guys again and uh, talk about stuff that we love doing and patients that we love taking care of. Yeah, and to that point, I could go on and on, Dr. Atlery and Dr. Ibrahim, about all of your accolades, all of your achievements. But what I'd like to do for the community today is really show them this. This is one of my favorite parts, is the smiling faces and the names of patients who were on heartvalvesurgery.com, members of our community, and went to Penn Medicine for very, very successful heart valve procedures. Whether it's Stephen Cantor, Mark Linus, Ron Seidorf, Gerald Schaefer, Evelyn Healy, on behalf of these patients, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Atlery, thank you for being with us today. And we are going to get started with Dr. Michael Ibrahim. Great. Thank you, um, Adam. And, uh, you know, the first thing I want to say just before we get onto the slides is, you know, uh, I know uh, many of your patients who are on the line will be thinking about surgery in the near future. And I understand one of the things that really motivated me to become a heart surgeon was was a family experience of being very close to a patient. Um, and, and honestly, I was a little bit disappointed about the communication from the physicians. And that was something that I was very motivated to change as I went through my own career. And I know that there's a lot of anxiety about waiting for one of these operations. Valve surgery in 2024 is in general, very safe, very effective and restores people's lives back to normal. Um, and so I just want to say, I understand how stressful this is for, for the patient community, but you know, um, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of uh, great outcomes and, and, you know, um, Hopefully you guys can partner with a surgeon that you feel comfortable with and and that can take you through that journey. But try not to worry too much. I think educational things like this are going to be very helpful for the community of patients that we have. Um, but uh, yeah, things think, you know, generally most patients do great. Um, but anyway, that will start um, with the first slide. 
Um, so what is robotic valve surgery? I think the most important thing to say is that when we do an operation robotically, we are doing precisely the same operation as we would be doing through a conventional stenotomy incision. One of the principles that, that uh, Dr. Lurie and I have, um, you know, is that we never compromise on the operation. So we want to do it robotically, we want to do it perfectly, but it must be perfect. And that's more important than any incision or any approach. Um, and as I said to you, about 80% of my valve operations are, are, are robotic, and but that's the focus. Um, the operation, you know, is performed by the surgeon. There's this myth sometimes that arises, is the robot sort of autonomously by itself doing the operation? No, the, the robot is a tool. Uh, just like a set of forceps, just like a uh, needle driver. But the operation is done by the surgeon. Um, we use the assistance of robotic arms um, that are placed between the ribs um, and that enter the patient's chest and into the heart under very careful control by the surgeon. So the surgeon is in complete control of the operation. We still use the heart lung machine. And to do these valve operations, we're still stopping the heart in exactly the same way as you would be uh, going through the front. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, here we sort of uh, have this slide that shows, uh, you know, uh, uh, close to home, the um, uh, evolution. Uh, so this is a stenotomy uh, patient. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty conventional incision, nothing wrong with that. But for many patients, we can go from this to um, these very small incisions. This is one of my patients that very kindly allowed me to use this uh, picture of her. Um, which shows this, you know, very small, about centimeter uh, or centimeter and a half uh, incision as the main working incision. And this is something that I've developed over a period of time uh, that, you know, 90% of my robotic patients, this will be the approach um, as a set of eight millimeter incisions that go around, you know, a central one to one and a half centimeter incision. I don't spread the ribs. I don't, uh, you know, sort of uh, make a big uh, thoracotomy or anything like that. But this is kind of generally what we're talking about. There's different types of millimeter surgery, but for me, this is what robotics looks like. Um, next slide, please. So this is the setup. So, you know, um, you can see my mouse, I think, but the patients, we're looking at the right chest. The patient's head is up here. The patient is draped under these drapes. The patient's feet are down here. And, you know, we're looking at, uh, these are ports, they're eight millimeters. They enter between the ribs. And there are uh, four of them that control two arms, a right, a right and a left arm, a camera, and then this is what we use to kind of retract inside the heart. And then this is what we use to, you know, put things in and out the chest as we need uh, material to repair the valve. This is another of my patients um, that, um, you know, has uh, kindly allowed us to use this. And I think one thing is, that, you know, this is not a um, uh, tiny patient. It's not a massive patient. It's uh, applicable for a very large number of patients. Um, next slide, please. Um, if you can just play these videos, these are the videos uh, that were taken by my resident of me doing a, a case a, a few weeks ago. And I think it just shows us I'm sitting on the robot. I'm about a meter away from the patient. The patient's heart is currently stopped and I'm working inside the heart to uh, introduce, uh, you know, stitches to repair the mitral valve in this case. Um, and uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, kind of en engrossed in this and um, working with my hands, you can see how the hands of the robot translate those movements into movements inside the patient. And this, I just think is useful to give patients kind of sense of, of what this actually looks like. Um, these machines are incredibly advanced. They're several million dollar machines. They are highly reliable. They translate our movements with perfect um, uh, precision. Um, and uh, they do a number of things. Uh, we get some tactile feedback from them. There's different ways of controlling the camera and the right and left arms and, and um, you know, energy tools that we may need to use uh, during the operation, but just a general sense. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so what is the rationale? Um, as I mentioned before, it's the same operation, just less invasively. And uh, we're able to do smaller incisions without opening the chest. Um, patients can recover faster. You know, I had a patient recently, I did a, a young person uh, who was very motivated to get back on the golf course. That was his kind of marker for himself that he was doing well. And he was back on the golf course on day four after the operation. I don't recommend that necessarily, but that's what he, he did. 
I honestly think it's actually a better visualization for the surgeon. Um, I think the dexterity for the surgeon is better. Um, this is uh, some uh, recent data that came out of the Society of Thoracic Surgeon, which is one of our largest academic institutions uh, in North America that tracks heart surgery. And these are matched patients. Um, so they compared people having, in this case, um, mitral valve surgery uh, through a stenotomy, conventional operation, through a thoracotomy, and through a robotic approach. And, you know, I won't go through all of it, but basically what you can see is that the robotic patients actually did pretty well. They did best out of the three groups that were examined. They had the lowest mortality. They had the shortest length of stay. They had the um, uh, lowest rates of conversion to replacement of the valve. And so there is no way in which the robotic approach compromises the quality and safety of the operation. And, and, and it may enhance it. Um, but certainly does not compromise it. So that's something that patients ask me a lot. You know, is this, are we paying a price in terms of compromising the operation for, for a robotic approach? The answer is absolutely not. The caveat, of course, is you've got to go to the right center because it's not just the surgeon, it's the team. Uh, is it, It's the anesthesiology team, it's the OR team, it's the post-operative team. They have to be looking at robotic patients all the time. And, um, uh, you know, that's what we do here at Penn um, but, um, you know, that's an important point. Uh, next slide, please, Andy. I think I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Laurie at this point. Yeah, so thanks, Mike. And um, Mike laid it out beautifully for you what the advantages of robot are, what the advantages of uh, non-sternotomy approaches. And I think what he said earlier is a very salient point, and that is the long term is the ultimate goal. It's something that we're all focused on and we can do it very cleanly with these approaches. And I think that's important. Um, un unfortunately, um, experience matters and there's people who may not have the same level of expertise on their team, but we're very, very fortunate that we've got this team that is highly experienced on all fronts. And so I really do think that we could provide the benefits. It's really the short-term benefits uh, in terms of recovery, in terms of incision, um, um, while maintaining the long-term, right? And the long-term, when we're talking about mitral valve disease especially, is normalized survival, normalized quality of life to an age and risk-matched population. Um, next slide. And so, not to belabor this, but there's a lot of advantages to a minimally invasive operation, and that is rapid recovery. So we see markedly shorter lengths of stay, short times in the ICU. Um, often these patients are extubated in the operating room, and they're back to activity really fairly quickly. I don't know if I'd recommend four days, Mike. There's still a little bit of soreness, but um, certainly a lot quicker. And that's been shown for, we've known that for well over a decade in multiple different forms that has been studied. Uh, we see lower rates of blood transfusion. I think one of the questions that um, was posed from the, from the audience was rates of, or potential for bloodless surgery. Now we take all the precautions we can in order to minimize blood transfusion. But in fact, the minimally invasive approaches, they bleed less, there's less places to bleed. And so the rates of blood transfusion in multiple series, including our own series, have shown lower rates of transfusion. The pain um, is certainly better. Um, you know, one of the things that we are cognizant about is how we um, approach the chest wall, the incisions that are made, how much we spread. Um, it's hard to do with zero pain because after all, we are making incisions in the chest, but that pain tends to subside fairly quickly. We utilize a protocol known as an ERAS protocol for more rapid um, recovery from pain. And importantly, in 2024, I think we've gotten very aware of the importance of minimizing narcotic pain medication. And these approaches really do allow us to minimize narcotic pain medication. You know, we've seen a lot of opioid addiction over the years, and we've, used, we've developed protocols in addition to procedures to help minimize the need for opioid pain medications and for the ability to pain to recover very quickly. There's obviously a cosmetic cosmetic benefit, and we're even seeing decreased rates of atrial fibrillation, depending on the series that you look at um, with non stenotomy approaches and robotic approaches. Next slide. 
So as we said earlier, the maintenance of long-term outcomes is the main objective, right? This is objective one through 10, and then we'll bring the rest all in. But our focus is making sure that you have a durable valve repair long-term that will rival any data that you see out there. And right now the data is very good. There's a lot of really good single center data out there that, that demonstrates durability from valve reintervention of greater than 90% at 20 years. And this has been shown in multiple series. And I can assure you that we do that. That is something that is our focus. We use the appropriate techniques to make sure the valves are repaired right. This is one of those sets of data. This was data that came out in 2013. This is data out of Toronto. That really shows a, a really optimal um, survival following mitral valve surgery. Now this is via sternotomy approaches um, that Tyrone David presented, but look at our data and it will largely parallel this. Next slide. Same thing that's been shown out of um, out of Italy and the Italians who also are very, very good um, mitral valve surgeons. And this in particular is a group out of uh, San Rafael Hospital in Milan. I know many of these surgeons are excellent surgeons and they've got really good data. Data that again, demonstrates very low reoperative rates, less than 5%. They got a 4% reoperation rate, which is the same numbers that we have. And that's at 19 years. So, um, you know, mitral valve repair can be done very well and hold up long-term. And that's the key. Next slide. And then Tyrone David again republished his data and again shows just really excellent long-term outcomes. Um, very low mortality from surgery, very low reoperative rate, very low rates of either atrial fibrillation or recurrent mitral regurgitation. So um, this is why we're pushing to do mitral valve surgery at an earlier stage. We also know that if we wait too long, um, heart damage can set in and can impact long-term survival. But when you're talking about operative um, risk well below 1%, um, with really, really durable repair, we can really make a very big impact on people's lives, both quality of life, as well as maintaining survival with these operations. And that can be done minimally invasively in the majority of our patients. Um, so the main message, repair the valve. Now, that being said, next slide, Adam. Um, when we've looked at our own data, we've seen that you can have nearly 100% um, repair rates um, with patients that do very well when you compare our minimally invasive groups with our sternotomy patients. Um, and this is data out to 10 years. And this is Penn Medicine. Next slide. Um, and again, long-term outcome, very low rates of recurrence of mitral regurgitation. And we're talking single digit rates um, with really good long-term outcomes. Next slide. And, you know, this data and, and a very good paper that was came out. Now this paper is almost eight, seven years old now. And this came out of Cleveland Clinic. Um, their techniques are very similar to ours. I know all the surgeons very well, um, talk to them all the time. And, um, you know, we all share best practices. And with these practices, they've achieved a nearly 100% survival rate with a nearly 100% repair rate, which is really quite remarkable. Next slide. So it is important to know that there can be risks associated with minimally invasive approaches. And we've seen some of them, right? It's vascular injury, it's potential for strokes. Um, the operative times can be longer. Um, there are other nervous structures that we could potentially um, uh, interact with along the way. One particular is the phrenic nerve, which supplies the diaphragm. And it's important that when we see an individual patient, we think about your risk factors and think about how we can avoid these because none of these problems will maintain a normal survival for you. So as we think about how best to approach um, each individual patient, I assure you, we think about all these issues and how we're going to minimize any complications. 
And um, and when we've looked at our own data, we've seen very low rates of complications. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, in our early days, back in the late 90s, we saw um, higher rates of vascular complications. And now we've done a lot of work. We've looked at very good screening techniques. And our current aortic dissection rates, our vascular complication rates are extremely, extremely low. And, you know, it's important to recognize that there is a learning curve with this, and there is a lot that can be learned um, over time. And so experience does matter. And you know, we've learned this. I've learned this from my mentor. We've passed this on to to Mike. Um, and so an experienced center will be able to provide that for you. At Penn, I'd, I'd like to think that we are able to use our experience to continue to improve on our outcomes and get nearly optimal outcomes for our patients. Next slide. And Dr. Atler, if I could, I imagine some patients are hearing you talk and they are getting these really important points, which is the learning that you and your team have experienced over the years. And mm -hmm. then at the same time, the importance of the team, the people who come together to perform these wonderful procedures, they might be wondering, how do I know if the center that I'm going to has these types of outcomes? Are there certain questions that you would, you would encourage them to ask? Or is there a reference out there? How can they know that they're going to the right place? Honestly, word of mouth, you know, talk to your cardiologist and then ask your surgeon. I, you know, I know very few people out there that will lie to you, but just ask them the hard questions. How long have you been doing this for? How many have you done? The question, that question is critical. You know, it's, um, it's astonishing, but if you look at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons data and the average number of mitral valves that are done, it's gone up over the years. It was three in the past, you know, and now it's up to six, but then you're also looking at many of us that are doing several hundred of these a year and you're averaging that out to, uh, you know, everybody else out there. So when you look at the median, the number that the majority are doing, it's close to three. Um, I can assure you no, anything I do three times a year, I am not going to be an expert at. If you're doing something 200 times a year, you'll certainly be an expert at it. So I think that's important. Ask them their outcomes. Ask them um, um, any good mitral surgeon will follow their patients long term. So ask them what the recurrence rates of mitral regurgitation are and how many patients they're having to reoperate on for recurrent mitral regurgitation. These are really important questions. And we'll get down to the, the meat and potatoes, right? Is this going to be a good durable operation for me long-term? And um, and then get a feel for them. I always, I get a lot of patients who come see me for second opinions. Um, and I'm never, I never undersell, I never oversell. It's important just to be honest with people and find that rapport with your surgeon. And, um, and, if you trust them, you're comfortable with what they're telling you, then make the decision. At some point, unfortunately, you do have to make that leap and trust that they will do what's right for you. Um, but those questions I told you have repeatedly been mentioned in multiple different forms as being important questions, and I would agree with that. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, um, I think uh, you know, it's very important every operation is different. Um, a, a stenotomy mitral valve repair is not a robotic mitral valve repair, is not a thoracotomy mitral valve repair. And I think it's very important to really get a handle on, you know, how many have you done? How many have you done, you know, per year? Um, what are the results, uh, you know? And and I, I, I have a slide deck that I show my patients that is very uh, open and upfront about, about that. Um, and, you know, I'm very proud of our results. Our results are excellent. They're the result of not only experience, but selection, um, care, the ability to rescue when there is a problem, um, and so on. And it's often the basic stuff that goes wrong that we hear about from other centers or, or you know, whatever that, that that leads to complications. And so I completely agree, um, uh, you know, that it is really important. And, and it's shocking the number of mitral valve repairs I mean, I just did a robotic mitral valve repair today. I've got another one tomorrow. You know, there are some surgeons, that's their whole experience for the entire year. And that is not good. You know, you do not want that person repairing your mitral valve. 
Um, yeah, I agree. So we can move on, but this is, you know, we use some fancy techniques to control the blood in the heart. Some of this takes experience and this data I'm showing you is from very experienced centers. Um, for instance, if somebody's going to try using this balloon that we put up to try controlling the heart, if you don't have experience, it will be an issue. So what are the contraindications? You know, when you look at the data sets, some of the early data sets have shown um, uh, increased rates of stroke, increased rates of vascular complications. It's important that we that we screen for that and make sure that we minimize those complications. And what are those? I'd say the really big contraindications are really bulky, bad vascular disease, big chunks of calcium in the aorta. And those are the ones that can really pose issues. They, they tend to um, cause problems in terms of potential for tearing the aorta. They can increase rates of stroke. So that's really the big contraindication. The rest of it all is um, that we're gonna talk about our relative. So ascending aorta that's big. After a certain size, we we don't wanna ignore other heart, other heart disease, right? So aortic aneurysms. After a certain size, we need to start thinking about do we treat this? And I've got a patient coming up where I've got to take care of his aorta at the same time. He's got an aneurysm. So if I fix your heart valve, leave you with an aneurysm that can be a risk down the line for rupture, I'm not doing you a favor. Um, along that same lines, an aortic valve that's leaking very badly may be hard to arrest at the time of, uh, to protect the heart appropriately at the time of mitral valve surgery. So at some point, we do need to start thinking about, is it time to address that aortic valve? Acute endocarditis is a relative contraindication. Early on, we would say no to it. I think it really depends on where the disease is and how much um, you need to do. But endocarditis could potentially be um, a contraindication depending on extent of disease. Very severe mitral annual calcification is one that I'm careful with. I've been very It's very humbling when you have a lot of mitral annual, annular calcification, and I deal with it a lot. Um, you know, I have other surgeons that send me these cases, but it is still very humbling even if you do a lot of it. Um, because calcium can be very delicate and it's something that you have to handle very carefully. Um, other uh, heart disease, vascular coronary artery disease is something that we need to tackle. Um, and it's not something that we want to leave behind. So if you have a, a blockage in one of your heart arteries, it's something that we will do a bypass with at the same time. And then really um, bad disease um, of your lungs, of um, like radiation heart that could potentially compromise the heart where every minute on bypass matters. Those patients, I try to really minimize any operative time at all possible. Um, over the last decade and a half, I've learned that some of these patients really struggle if you, do, if you don't minimize some of their the amount of time that the heart is stopped um, pectus can be, depending on the extent of, um, of disease, and then um, radiation heart disease that we talked about. So what do, next slide, what do we do to help, help evaluate for this? Really three major tests, um, transesophageal echocardiogram, which is really important not only to look at the mitral valve disease, but also gives us a, a sense of what the aorta looks like, what the aortic valve looks like, and it's also a really good way of looking at any calcium burden um, in the aorta itself, um, a CAT scan. And every once in a while, I'm really surprised that I pick up disease, and this is one of my patients from years ago on the bottom, um, that surprisingly picked up a dissection in his groin vessel. And if that's the case, you don't want to be using that for bypass because that, that tear can propagate all the way up to the heart. Um, and then a heart cath. And it gives us really two pieces of information when you get the cardiac catheterization. One is really knowing where the coronary arteries are relative to the valve. And then second, to make sure that there's no heart disease. Next slide. And this is just an example of the CAT scan. And you see the aorta is the bright white blood vessel. And this is the blood vessel that we utilize um, in minimally invasive approaches to um, to make sure that the blood flows to the body and that um, we're able to safely keep the body with good blood flow 
um, during the operation. So the CAT scan gives us a lot of information to make sure that when we reverse the blood flow growing up to the heart, that we're able to uh, do this very safely and protect the patient and um, all their organs. Next slide. Next slide. Now this is a pectus patient, depending on how bad this is, this can sometimes pose an issue. Um, some of these patients, we've even had to repair the pectus where the heart is basically touching the left chest on the other side. We've, um, in those situations, sometimes um, we've had thoracic surgeons come in and actually repair the pectus, restore the chest anatomy. And a lot of that is cosmetic, but sometimes something that they want to do. Um, but really bad pectuses can pose visualization issues. So next slide. So this is, you know, standard approach. Um, this is my approach. I think Mike's approach is very similar. Um, we uh, put a put two IVs in the neck. One is to measure pressures in the heart. Uh, the other is for the heart lung machine. And then we put um, cannula in the groin. Um, one is to drain the blood, the venous cannula. One is to return blood, and that's the arterial cannula. And um, the majority of our patients, um, we use an endoaortic balloon, which allows us to further keep incision small, keep the field clean. And um, next slide. Um, that balloon goes in and it basically blows up inside the heart and separates blood flow from the heart from the body. Um, Mike showed you this earlier. Um, and this is a patient who's been docked for a robot. Um, you see pictures of me at the console there, but um, we have some pretty standard robotic setup. These are uh, several of my patients that have recovered over the years, and you see that they heal pretty nicely. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I think uh, uh, Pavan hit a, a lot of the different uh, important points about the way that we approach this. Um, and, uh, you know, for almost all patients with degenerative mitral valve disease, we are looking to repair the valve. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think for most patients, that's going to be the case in 90% in with a 90% chance. But there are some patients who need a mitral valve replacement. We can also do that robotically. Uh, just to hit a couple of little things that I've seen crop up in the questions, you know, if you've had a previous mitral valve repair that, that is failing, it can either be re-repaired or replaced robotically. Uh, repeat operations are not a problem. I do that routinely. Um, and, you know, we've pushed the limits uh, on on what we think is 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 safe and, and, and suitable for a robotic candidate. Um, based on the development of of techniques, and you know our results are, are outstanding. A, a person in in terms of you know um, uh, strokes and things like that, very 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 low um, rates of stroke. So anyway, um, who do we think about mitral valve replacement for? We think about valves that cannot be repaired. Either there's not enough tissue, there are lesions that are not repairable, um, there is extensive damage, infection, other things um uh, that, that can't be repaired um rheumatic disease where the valve is very scarred down often those are very difficult to repair often they have um additional mitral valve stenosis where the problem is not just that the valve is leaking but it's also not opening very well that is a situation where we would consider mitral valve replacement and then some patients um, who have functional mitral regurgitation who either have failed medical therapy or have had other therapies like uh, mitra clips and, and other things that are now uh, looking to need mitral valve replacement uh, next slide please Adam. Um, so it's the same basic setup as uh, myself uh, and, and Parvin showed you. Uh, slightly bigger incision because you have to fit an actual valve in there. And we can do mechanical or biological valves, and I've done these uh, robotically, uh, you know, both of these. Yeah, so some special scenarios, things that we've done um, that kind of, again, push the boundaries a little bit. Uh, prior cardiac surgery, I've shown you a few examples of that. This is a congenital valve. This is a very, very young patient. 16-year-old, um, I believe, that I operated on robotically that had a prior ASD repair, but had been left as a baby with a cleft in the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And you can see that, that big V kind of gash in, in, in the mitral valve and a lot of leak coming through that. 
Um, so we were able to to repair this valve um, to put together that cleft and 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 uh, put in a mitral valve annuloplasty um, and and you know uh, leave her with no uh, no leak and she's doing wonderfully well. Uh, we can re-repair valves. Um, uh, something I've also done uh, robotically. Uh, we've fixed uh, uh, other cardiac problems, holes in the heart, like atrial septal defects or ASDs. I've also done ventricular septal defects and VSDs robotically when they are appropriate. One of the most important things is that a lot of patients who have mitral valve disease also have atrial fibrillation. And one of the commitments that we make here at Penn is that no patient is going to be undertreated by a robotic approach. So um, we do full atrial fibrillation ablations, uh, mazes, Cox maze fours, um, and, and closure of the left atrial appendage um, to reduce the stroke risk after surgery um, uh, with, robotically. So that, that's something that, that is very important. And also myxomas and tumors of the heart can be approached robotically also. And other valve operations, aortic valve operations are something that we're starting to do robotically, but that's a little bit less developed than mitral valve surgery for sure. Next slide, please. So I think we just kind of to, wanted to wrap up here and open up for questions. I think the time went a little bit behind, but not too bad. Um, you know, robotic mitral and, and, and cardiac surgery is at least as safe and effective as conventional surgery for the right patient. There are benefits for the patient and for the conduct of the operation, getting an excellent valve result. Um, you need a surgical team that is well-versed in robotic and mineral access surgery and mitral valve surgery in general. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, the median number of Average number of, of mitral valves done by most heart surgeons in the country is three, three to five. Um, that's what I'm doing in a week sometimes. And so, you know, that is not um, that that is the most important thing. Um, and also very, very specifically, what is the experience with robotics? What is the development of the program? What are the results? Um, and so, you know, with that, Adam, we'd like to open it up to questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Atlery for the prepared remarks. That was fascinating. I know I learned a lot. And I'm sure many people on the line uh, have caused them to think and question some of what we've learned today. So let's do that. Let's get to some of the questions here. It's my favorite part. And we only have a little bit of time here, but so let's, if we could do rapid fire Q&A. I know that's not always easy to do, but let's get right to it. Kelly asks, I've heard that robotics require longer times on the heart lung machine. Is that true? And can that lead to pump head? It's a good question. Um, you know, so uh, I think it depends. Um, you know, I, 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 for, for a straightforward mitral valve repair, my time that the, on the heart lung machine is not very different between a stenotomy and a, and a robotic approach. Uh, that probably was not true in the earlier experience, but I think it's gotten substantially, uh, the same, to be honest. Um, and, and I, I think that we're so safe and meticulous with the use of the heart lung machine and the degree of monitoring that it really is not a big deal for most patients. Um, but, um, Yeah. Okay. And let's move on to uh, Jeff's question. How are the incisions from the robot closed? Is plating used? No, it's suture. Um, they're very easy to close. They're very small incisions. So plating is really just for the for bone, and we're not bringing the ribs back together. We want to leave them in native orientation. Great. Let's move over to Shirley's question. And I think I heard you, Dr. Atlery, talk about ERAS protocols. She asks, do patients who have robotic valve surgery follow the ERAS protocol? Maybe you can inform patients on the line what that is. Yeah, it's a protocol we utilize. Um, it's got multiple facets, including how they're hydrated, um, non, a, a, a whole cocktail of non-narcotic medications that are utilized. And then we do nerve blocks in addition to provide temporary relief on top of that all. So it's really a protocol to help minimize pain as well as um, minimize or eliminate narcotic use. Got it. Thank you. And let's move on to BK, who and I, I think you just referenced this, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, BK says, I have AFib and valve disease. Can both be treated? If so, how? And what are the success rates for stopping my AFib during a valve surgery? Yeah, so great question. Um, absolutely. Uh, in fact, just earlier today, I did a mitral valve repair with an ablation. 
Um, I did exactly the same ablation as I would have done through a stenotomy. I closed the appendage of the heart, which is very important because it's a little sac that sits there. In atrial fibrillation, the top chamber of the heart is no longer beating and, and moving blood through, but fibrillating. And so it allows blood to sit there and it kind of um, settles in this basket uh, that can form clots and they can lead to stroke. And we know that closure of that sac substantially reduces the risk of stroke. So we're able to do that robotically uh, at the time of mitral valve surgery with absolutely the same results as you would uh, through a conventional stenotomy. And what Mike said is important, Adam, um, is that, that there's data out there that's very strong that, that the closure of that appendage may actually be one of the most important things that we do. So it's it's critical that that is managed. Agreed. Fantastic. And this, I, I think, Dr. Atlery, you talked a little bit, maybe Dr. Ibrahim, about kind of the evolution of the robot to other forms of valve disease, mitral, you talked about repair and replacement. Kathy asks, I was wondering if a robot can be used to treat bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. Yeah, so um, it is being used um, for that. Um, it is something that is in development right now. It depends. You know, again, I think with things like this, and it's interesting that the patient is specifically asking about bicuspid, and most of the bicuspid patients, as you know, are young, you know, the, the incision is secondary to the operation. So, you know, I get patients to come and see me with bicuspid valves who are 40 years old, and I always tell them, listen, you know, you should think about Ross, um, because, you know, it's it, the, the valve disease management, whether that's a mitral valve repair, whether it's a Ross versus a mechanical valve, whether it's, you know, it is really much more important than the approach that we're using for it. Um, and so I think that's the discussion that needs to be had around that. Is it possible? Yeah, a lot of the things that are technically possible, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's the best thing for you. Just as if you're if you're 30 or 40 years old, sure, you could have a tab of valve, that would work, but it may not be the best thing for you in the sense that it may not restore your life survival uh, and your life expectancy to normal. Very, well, I think is very much in debate, Adam. Um, and something in development. So, but what Mike said is is critical, which is to consider alternate strategies, right? Which is like the Ross has been huge, um, and um, and yeah. So I would just leave it at in development. Um, but make sure again that you think about all options when you meet with your surgeons, and that all options are discussed. Well, and I really appreciate for the folks on the line. Uh, you know the big takeaway for me is the lifetime management of the disease, right? What can you do that you can plan on how to get to 90? What are those procedures? If, like you say, Dr. Ibrahim, this might be a younger patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. I think you have already addressed this question, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, in terms of converting. If there's an issue with the robot, there's an issue with the procedure, we're going to skip this one unless I miss what you said. You can convert over to an open heart procedure, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. If needed, th those rates are very low, but if needed, absolutely. Great. I think you also said for patients who might be Jehovah's Witness, cannot have blood products, this can be done using a bloodless procedure, correct? Yes. Okay. And then this is a, we got several questions about recovery timelines. So the big three were, when can I exercise? When can I drive? And when can I go back to work? Yeah. So, um, uh, I actually just looked this up for my pick. We're actually writing up a series that that compares different approaches and and because you know I I think this I get asked this a lot um, you know and and so so um, within two weeks eighty five percent of the robotic patients are driving okay um, which means that they're no longer taking opiates they're you know able to safely operate their car they you know feel like they're able to get out and about. Um, and that that is more like four weeks for some of the other approaches, conventional um, sort of uh, surgical approaches. And so um, I think there is a benefit there in terms of getting people back up. And I think this is really one of the big uh, you know, selling points for minimally invasive surgery. Yeah, I think two weeks is the magic number. Honestly, I don't. It's probably day zero because you're not disrupting the chest wall, right? But um, I just tell my patients two weeks just to be on the safe side, but you could probably almost go immediately. Got it. And so we are coming to the top of the hour. And so we are going to wrap up on that question, but I'd ask you to not go ahead and close out just yet. 
Um, on behalf of our entire community, I want to take a minute and thank Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Atlery from Penn Medicine Heart and Vascular Center for taking the time to put together this wonderful educational presentation, participate in the Q&A, and just be wonderful members of our community. So thank you so much, Dr. Atlery and Dr. Ibrahim. Thanks, Great. Thank you all. Thanks, Adam.